Hey folks, Ray from DCRemaker.com here. 2018 is definitely set to be the year of aero technology. So we've seen a few of those already started to leak out over the last, uh, I'd say, six to eight months. Uh, there's been you know, a number of companies that have kind of come onto the scene. Um, now we saw a bunch of those show up last year at Eurobike in 2017, kind of like sneak peek type stuff. Uh, the Notio one, uh, there's Alpha Mantis, which Garmin then bought last year as well. There's AeroLab, which I showed you back in January. Uh, and then we have Swiss Side as well, which I started talking about some of their pieces. Uh, and there's a few more that we'll get into down the road. Again, lots of companies, no one yo has yet actually started like producing their device and made it available in the market for you to buy and start riding with. Um, but we're getting close and I've been trying different ones out. Is I can make this like a series of sorts, if you will. Uh, and what I've got today is PowerPod's new uh, AeroPod sensor. Now this builds upon the power pod that we saw in the past. Uh, that was a non-direct force power meter that used essentially aerodynamics to trim your power. In most scenarios, it worked pretty darn well, actually. Uh, there's a couple caveats here and there, but you know, the, the power pod generation and some of the firmware updates along the way made it actually pretty impressive. Uh, of course, there were still detractors from it, but one of the things the detractors always admitted to it is that if you had a direct force power meter, basically most other power meters in the market, and had the power pod aero sensor, you could actually do some pretty cool stuff with aerodynamic testing. And that's exactly what they're doing here. Um, if you combine it with the direct force power meter, which by the way, all these aero sensors will require a power meter. There's, uh, that's kind of like the, the starting point because they have to determine what power is changing when aerodynamic changes happen as well. So with the AeroPod, uh, it basically goes ahead and it'll determine your CDA in real time. Your CDA is your coefficient to drag uh, and essentially measures how aero you are. In other words, if I have wearing flappy clothing or something like this, that's not super aero, uh, it's gonna show a higher number. If I'm you know, down a time trial position, on a nicely tuned in bike, it's gonna show a lower number. Uh, I'm today testing on a road bike because they don't have the mount yet ready uh, for the tri bike, so I can't test that. So therefore my CDA numbers that you'll see here are gonna be crazy high, uh, not helping the fact that I've got like all sorts of extra crap on this bike uh, for testing, but that's real okay. Really the point is to show you what the technology they're doing. I'm not really focused on error or uh, accuracy for today. Instead, I'm focused on just kind of showing the technology. Down the road, we'll talk about accuracy and, and really how that's gonna be kind of a challenging thing for all these players to demonstrate in some ways because uh, there is no like comparison that I can use out on the road very easily as a known good. Um, so what we have is down there is the power pod. You can see it uh, right there. This place is really empty just a few minutes ago. Now it's full of tourists. Um, so the power pod that you see right now on my bike is similar to the ones that have been in the market for a few years now, uh, but this has totally different internals on it, uh, both software and hardware, but that's actually not what you'll get at the end of the day on the AeroPod. Um, instead, it'll look totally different, look like what I'm putting on the screen right now, but that hardware isn't ready when I'm shooting this video. Uh, it may be ready in the next couple weeks for me to go ahead and start playing with, but uh, that has a different uh, pitot tube sensor on it and basically gets a little more accurate results. Uh, nonetheless, we're gonna work with this today. What I'm using in conjunction with that is a Garmin Edge uh, 520 plus, uh, 1030 and here, I'll show you. 520 plus up there, 1030 and 130. Um, and those three things are overkill. You'll need one of them. Uh, any Garmin that supports Connect IQ uh, and that'll go ahead and show you the data fields from the AeroPod uh, in real time. In addition, you can also use the EveriSight Raptor glasses uh, that are just started shipping here in the last couple of days as well, like a heads up display. Uh, so that could be really interesting for time trials too. Now you may be wondering why on earth you'd want to know CDA. Um, now as I mentioned earlier, it's all about aero and it's about determining how aero you are. The challenge with going to a wind tunnel or a velodrome and doing testing there is that that is at that point in time on that day. Having done both of those things from a testing standpoint, it's incredibly valuable and there's lots of useful stuff you can get out of it. The challenge though is remembering that precise position one day later, one week later, one month later, even a year later. Uh, and you may say, oh, that's easy, right? You'll, you'll be able to figure that out, no problem. I promise you it's not that easy. In fact, those same testers, in fact, every one of those companies will tell you stories about their pro athletes at Kona not having the positions they had in the wind tunnel or in the testing facilities. And that's because the smallest of positions matter. Even just uh, half a centimeter one way or the other actually can be a big aero difference. How you tilt your head like this or like this is a huge aero difference. And so the ability to see that on the road in real time as you're racing is massive. And that's sort of the holy grail that everyone's going to from Garmin to AeroLab to uh, now AeroPod. Okay, I had to get away from the windmill. It was pretty and all and a good backdrop for the uh, Aero stuff, but there was just a gazillion tourists and they were all like taking pictures of me, taking pictures of, it was getting a little crazy. Um, so as I was saying, it's incredibly valuable. The ability for you to do that in a race will be game changing for the sport, uh, for endurance sports primarily, not so much for road cyclists uh, out, you know, in, uh, on the Tour de France, but 
it will be for triathletes primarily or time trials in the tour as well. Okay, so let's look at some numbers. Now keep in mind that I'm holding a foot long gimbal with a camera attached to it and sitting up to be able to do all this and show you this on my bike. So the numbers that you see here will be high, um, also adding the road bike factor of it, but that's okay because again, just trying to show you how it works. So let's go down to the Garmin. Okay, so here we are, look at things. I swapped the Garmin's around so you have a bigger screen to look at for the video. So on the top there, I've got a, the generic data field that power, and then the bottom I have a connect Q data field that inset has four data fields inside of it. So you see CDA there at 0 .40, uh, 403, 402, which actually is not horrible given what I've got going on the road right now with me. Uh, and then I've got the wind there, auto lap, thank you. Got the wind showing a 0 0.25, or 2.5 miles an hour, 2.9 miles an hour. And then the slope, uh, which is my grade right now at basically flat. It's just kind of fluctuating this road, just rolls very, very slightly here. And then my time advantage, this is over my default or stock position. Uh, so I did this calibration back uh, yesterday and it was a good calibration, but it wasn't like awesome. But the idea there is that you can go ahead and set your default CDA and kind of work from that as a baseline. In this case, I would say that the value I put in there is probably incorrect. So I'm not going to worry about that, but you can see again how it works and the concept of it. And so you can go ahead and use that to compare things as you go along. Now, when it comes to aero testing, a couple things you got to keep in mind. First and foremost is that you need to be really, really steady. Um, so you'll notice these numbers are getting a bit better as I ride here because I'm getting more steady. They're smooth over a longer period of time on purpose. All the aero testing companies do that. They do that because they want you to be able to go ahead and hold position for usually a minute or two, if not five minutes. So you can go ahead and get kind of really valid data there. Also, it's windy here, which isn't horrible for aero testing, but it's not ideal either. So it's kind of like halfway in between. What is ideal though, is this road. Let me just show you this real quick. So this is where you want to aero test. There's almost no traffic out here whatsoever. No cyclists, no nothing. You should not be in a draft pack while doing aero testing. You should have essentially nobody around you. You want to avoid cars because they too can give a draft. You want somewhere where you don't have to stop and start because that'll impact your numbers when it comes to braking force. Um, so thankfully I could ride like for a really long ass time before I have to hit the brakes. Uh, so this is sort of perfect conditions for it. Now, of course, not everyone has that. So if you don't have that, you want to do something like a looped course or Something along those lines where you can keep on going around and around a small section that is basically known and clean all the way around. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and down into the drops to show you a little bit of the aero difference here. Now, when I do that, I'm gonna hold it for a little bit longer and then I'm gonna pop out real quick and show you the numbers before it re-averages it because again, camera and all that crap makes it tough to do that. But afterwards, of course, all this data is saved, by the way, to both Garmin Connect via your Garmin file as well as to their PowerPod software that you can go ahead and use too. So here we go. And again, you want to wait a little bit of time to do this. So I'm starting to see a drop now. Uh, 0.305, yeah, 305, 303, 301. Slowly going down. Let's see if you can slide it below. There we go, 0.298, 295. 294. And again, ideally you want to hold position for like a minute or longer so it can kind of stabilize. So let me pop up and show you that 0.294 right now. So you can see right there, it's already climbing up as I sat back up again. So one of the challenges with aero testing in general is that claims around aero and how aero something is, like a helmet or a piece of clothing, but especially a helmet or a bike, is very specific to a given person. It's based on that person's body type and how they ride and everything. So it's not really so easy to say this helmet is faster than that helmet because if you talk to anyone in the industry that does that kind of stuff, they'll say, well, that helmet is faster on this person, but on this other person, it's slower. And I saw that myself when I went aero testing back a couple years ago. Additionally, aero testing is incredibly expensive. So if you wanted to test your position or your gear day in, day out, there's no way that anyone could afford that, even the team skies of the world. Instead, they go in and they test gear and whatnot, 
kind of one time for the season. And I think in some cases, that's where traditional aero testing venues like a wind tunnel or a velodrome is probably better than out on the road because it's a lot easier for you to leave a pile of gear on a table by the side of the track than it is out here in the middle of farms. Inversely, I think out here is a better place to test positional stuff because I can keep riding all day long and I can tweak it as I go until I find that exact spot I like. And then and on race day, I can go right back to that spot use the numbers on my screen to help me fine tune that in. Price wise, the Aeropod has launched at $4.99 on Kickstarter, which is in the ballpark of everyone else, maybe a touch bit lower than everyone else, but no one else has actually like made their products available to purchase yet. So, you know, in that sense that sort of the first one out there, but everyone has been talking between basically 500 bucks and 800 bucks is sort of that, that uh, landing ground for these sensors targeted at the consumer. Finally, the last challenge all these companies are gonna have is making that experience easy. I think PowerPod's done a good job, and to be fair, most of these companies that are using Connect IQ data fields have done a really good job making that pretty straightforward, but the setup process is where the, the devil is. Uh, you wanna talk about the devil in the details? That's it there, and that's certainly the case here as well. It's a clumsy setup process, just like it is on every other one I've tested, and I think they gotta find a way, all these companies have to find a way to get past that and make it super slick and easy. The app has to be slick and easy. The interface is set up. I think it's gotta be straightforward. Otherwise, the technology as a whole won't catch on for the market it wants to, which is already a bit of a niche market. Okay, with that, I'm tired of holding this camera out here. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this things up. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and whack that like button if you found this interesting or the subscribe button. There's been a ton of good stuff coming out of Seattle this week. Uh, plenty more to come in the next couple weeks as well. So you don't wanna miss any of that. Have a good one.